Nihal. Uh, I have for you today a small story, um, Xiao Gu Shi. Um, 但是我的普通话不好，所以我需要说英文。But most of what I'm going to talk about is going to come out of this box. They are prototypes from many years, over the past ten years,、um, culminating in some of the new work that myself and a couple other folks around the world are working on.、Um, going to be talking about two companies. These companies may not see rela seem related at first, but I assure you they are. One is Looking Glass, and Looking Glass is developing a new art medium, sort of a new art form. And Looking Glass is a spin-out company from Haddock Invention, an invention workshop that I've run for the past eight years. Haddock is really、uh, it's just five people, and we're in a small workshop in a little industrial area of Hong Kong. And、um, we can do big things even with a small group of people because we work with other small groups around the world. So we have four partner labs that we work with in New York, the Philippines, occasionally Guatemala, in Shenzhen,、um, and in Paris.、Uh, and what we work on in these labs, collaborating a lot like how bands might collaborate to do a new record, but with technology, but for technology, is、uh, we work on. Actually, it's、um, we don't work on cleaning tech. I told you my Chinese wasn't good. In some of the documents, it says that we work on cleaning technology, but we are not pioneering the world's greatest mop or the world's greatest broom. We're working on clean green tech, like wind power and solar power. And、uh, over the past eight years of doing this work, being part of this big invention network, I've.、Uh, I've learned that invention isn't a single event in time. It's not a single event、um, that occurs in one place. Invention is actually a lot more like a weather system, where ideas float across space and time,、um, a lot like the weather. You don't know when something that has been picked up from the ocean somewhere in the Philippines is going to then deliver a new idea in a new team somewhere across the world five or ten years later. In a completely different field than maybe that original idea started from, and that's what the whole the subject of my ten minutes on this stage are: It's to convince you、um, with a narrative. It's sort of I'm making this more linear than it really is. Than it really is. There's a narrative fallacy that goes on、um, in people's brains, but I'm going to try to organize everything that's happened over the last eight years、um, into connections between five different inventions. And the first invention starts with trying to eliminate the packaging peanut. The packaging peanut is、uh, something that is a universal irritation. When you open up a, a little box that you get in the mail for Christmas time, and you pull it out, all the styrofoam goes all over your living room.、Um, nobody likes it. The environment doesn't like it. The people who are packing the package sure don't like it. Because they have to store gigantic amounts of styrofoam packaging peanuts, and eight years ago, myself, a couple other people, and a design lab in Greenwich Village in New York, we collaborated to come up with a solution.、And、the solution is called Wonderfill,、uh, and <laughs>、um, basically, what it does. I've got a little sample here. It's just a simple bag. But what this bag does is it takes technology from big companies like Amazon.com, where you can have a really, really friendly to the customer and to the environment packaging solution that's mostly air, and it takes that technology, which usually costs three, four, five, ten thousand dollars, to inflate and seal plastic bags for packaging, and it reduces the cost by ten or twenty times. By Building in a new type of、um, inflatable system, where we have a valve built into、um, this simple plastic bag.、Uh, so instead of requiring a complex machine, we have a very inexpensive fan that just blows at the general direction of this bag. And I'm going to blow at it to show you. So now the air is trapped inside, and you can actually stick a straw in it and release the air.、Um, 
when you receive the package so you can save it and reuse it. I'll pass a couple of these around so you can also trap your air and Woo! give it back to me. And then something unexpected happened. And uh, the unexpected thing was jumping from the green packaging field into the water disinfection field. So um, I was talking with some folks that run an organization called Sondek in Switzerland. And uh, Sondek had pioneered this amazing, beautiful, beautifully simple technology and science of solar water disinfection. And the way it works is when you have biologically contaminated water, uh, using the soda system, which this group Sondek pioneered, you can put the biologically contaminated water into any two liter bottle or one liter bottle. And then you set it on the roof for one to two days. During those one to two days, the water in the bottle gets hit by lots of UV light, just like the UV light that would give you a sunburn. And the water also will spike to around 50 degrees Celsius just by sitting on the roof, any roof. Um, and those two things combined completely disinfect the water of biological contamination. But there is a problem. Three million people in the world use this system to get their clean water. It's maybe even more now. Why isn't it 20 million or 30 million people? It's so simple. And part of the problem is getting these bottles from urban areas into rural areas where a lot of the need is for clean water is expensive. Even if the empty bottle itself is free, the shipping of the bottles over the worst infrastructure in the world in developing countries is not free. So that free bottle maybe ends up costing 50 cents or a dollar when it reaches its final destination. So I was talking to Sondek about how we could possibly make a bag that was very inexpensive to produce, made of one material so it would be easy to reprocess after its lifetime, and went back to this work where we actually had developed this valve that held air in a bag. And uh, so then we made this. Um, this is a bag that holds water instead of air. So you just, it's all made of one type of material, can be made on the same machine that would package mangoes. Water pours in, and this is sort of the magic-y part of the show, and then it stays in. Thank you, thank you. And then you can get it out too. It's not trapped in there forever. So you just pop out this little nozzle and then you can pour it out. Um, this ended up being more inexpensive than adding hard plastic parts to this product. So that's in pilot in a number of places around the world. And then something else unexpected happened. Invention three. I was, uh, I actually remember this very, very well. I was um, sitting um, in the middle of Haiti, in the middle of a very unusual bamboo forest uh, and bamboo community. Um, actually, it was a partnership between Haiti and Taiwan. And um, while I was sitting there and we were piloting some of these uh, solar water disinfection bags, it was very hot and the electricity was out, of course. And I was looking outside and I was reviewing the day and the last few weeks in my mind. Um, and what people, what we had been talking about with everyone um, in the community. And a recurring theme was that clean water is awesome. Um, we also want to develop new small energy systems. And at the time, it was very hard to make small solar um, on demand uh, in a particular um, country. There's only a few countries that do solar processing now. So turned to wind power, and I was thinking about, can we scale down a turbine? It turns out that doesn't work. It's very inefficient. Um, and, and I was looking outside my window while I was thinking about it, and I saw the Haitian flag um, flapping in the wind. And for some reason, seeing that flag, and maybe it was in combination with looking at the equipment that was making the sodas bags, where we have long stretches of plastic that are held taut, and they sort of wobble around as you look at them. Um, maybe these things combined um, to yield the world's first non-turbine wind harvester. So this doesn't use a rotating turbine blade. This uses a piece of material. It could be a piece of plastic or a piece of kite material, a piece of fabric. And this material vibrates a lot like how a flag would flap in the wind or a blade of grass would 
would wiggle between your hands when you make a whistling noise, but it creates electricity. Um, so I'll show you an old prototype here. This has been in the family for years. So I'm going to do my little parlor trick. So air blows across here. I'm going to make sure it works. We can, pass this, we can pass this around to take a look at it. It's an heirloom now. And uh, there's been hundreds of, yeah, yeah, I've practiced that for years. Um, <laughs> there's uh, hundreds of people that have made versions of the wind belt using PVC pipe, using bamboo, using Legos. I saw, I saw one with Legos the other day, using VHS tape, um, mostly for education, but some for making little amounts of power. Um, and then hop to the next, uh, next invention, which, which this one isn't actually very surprising. Well, we were working on small-scale wind power, so why not also work on production of small-scale solar power? Um, so that's what myself and uh, good friend Alex and his lab collaborated on for a project called the Solar Pocket Factory. We launched this on Kickstarter. It was successful. Um, and we developed a number of products, like here's a, these are what we launched on Kickstarter, but we built a machine actually to make solar panels. This is a kit that lets people make solar panels on their own. And um, here's a little solar Arduino shield that lets you power up an Arduino. Pass these around. It's an interactive part of the program. Um, and then the most unexpected thing happened. The culmination of unexpectedness. Uh, and it was that um, it came from designing actually a more efficient solar panels. Because one thing when you design a solar panel that you have to keep in mind is you want as much light to hit the silicon as you possibly can have. Um, and there's reflections that happen as the light travels through the glass on the top of the solar panel and goes through that little thin gap of air between the glass and the silicon, you get a bounce of four to six percent of the light. Um, so you add material between the glass and the silicon. It's called index matching material. It's really just a fancy word for some sort of gel or some sort of um, adhesive that you can fill the airspace with so that the light will pass seamlessly through the glass without a reflection hitting the silicon. And this was a core idea that was in the back of all of our minds um, when I started to experiment with uh, a new type of printing technology. It's not a 3D printer, and it's not a hologram. It's something in between these two. And I don't know why I started working on this. I think it's probably because all of my friends, like Zach, were working on awesome 3D printers, and I was stuck making solar panels. But it led to this. And I can't really show you well on stage, so I'll show you a little video. Everything you see here is based on 3D models that other people have designed, and some of us, some of the folks in the lab have designed. There's nothing in this box. There's no object inside, and it's not a hologram. These are actually all made with a simple process using a 2D printer to make 3D renderings. So we can take artwork, even crazy artwork like this that a friend put together, and pull it off of the computer and get it into the real world for prints that maybe 3D object printing can't do, like scenes. So I'm going to show everyone what this looks like. <clears throat> so one of the challenges is um, this process is you take a 3D model, and you can talk more at my booth back there afterwards, but you take a 3D model, and then you slice it with some software, just like a CAT scan or an MRI. And uh, this, this is, act we actually, Alex designed, my friend Alex designed the world's first open source uh, color slicer, which is now out and open. We launched it a, about a week ago. Um, and after you slice those, those 3D files, you end up getting, let me see if I can balance this here. You get a bunch of, you can print one piece of each of that 3D file on a sheet of plastic. It could also be something more bio-friendly, like a cellulose acetate. And then as these sheets stack up, you start to regenerate a 3D scene just by having sheets of material each with a small section of the 3D model stacked closely together. Um, 
And this is what a couple hundred sheets, it's 165 sheets actually, looks like um, up here uh, when they're stacked together. You can't see through it. There's actually a fish in there, but you can't see the fish because there's about 4% of light reflection as the light passes through each interface between the plastic layer and the air gap. And then when you stack up 20 or 30 or 40 or 100 sheets together, you can't see through the stack anymore. And it just looks like this. So, looked around the lab and all the friends we've been working with over the years and saw all these index matching materials. So we took one of the index matching materials and pumped it into this box. I'm making this a little more simple than it actually was. Pumped it into this box and then that's what results. That was actually hidden inside there and produces this fish which a guy in our lab, Alvin, just drew. There's actually nothing inside. It's just a sort of an illusion. I'll pass these around too. Using a 2D printer to make 3D renderings. Here's another one. This is on Lego guys. These two are our first prints, also archival. Um, and here's a shark. This is a tribute to Damien Hirst. Okay. So the big, big lesson for me um, has been that um, all of these unrelated fields are actually tied together by little wisps of connections of ideas and by people. And, um, you know, it went from a green packaging solution to a solar water disinfection solution to a non-turbine wind harvester to solar panels to uh, volumetric printing service, which I believe will be one of the world's um, new art mediums. Um, and this whole big weather system of ideas that I've just been one small part of um, has been powered by non-specialists. It's been entirely powered by amateurs. Um, n none of these, nobody on the team knew anything about any of these fields. And I think that's why uh, these are creative solutions that other people hadn't done before. Um, everyone ends up being an inventor, and that's what I'd like to leave you with. So I'm unsure if I'm in Woo! <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, John.